Welcome back to uh, Reimagine uh, here in our ninth edition uh, of the conference. Uh, you know, here we are. The game of chains is the focus and theme of this particular conference. Uh, and such an interesting time to be talking about this sort of conversation. You know, so many different projects, uh, you know, developing uh, for better or worse at the moment. You know, there's a lot of hype around. Uh, a lot of uh, sort of bluster, but also a lot of really good work getting done and separating that, that noise from the signal is so critical to really understanding the space. Uh, so with us now, uh, you know, we have a man who I think exemplifies, you know, that sort of stir, you know, ardent key development that needs to be done in the space and is trying to, you know, put his money where his mouth is and, and make that happen. Uh, of course, I'm um, talking about Anatoly Yakovenko, uh, co-founder of Solana. Uh, Anatoly, firstly, thanks so much for being with us. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. So I'm not going to beat around the bush here, man. You know, you guys have just come back, uh, coming off the back of launch of announcing your $314 million funding round. Obviously, huge news, plenty in the war chest. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about it, uh, what that means to you guys, how it came about. Give us a little bit of context. Um, well, you know, the, we, the ecosystem has been growing so rapidly since we launched that uh, it became obvious that this network is really like, I think, um, the true, you know, if, if there's going to be an alternative smart contract platform, um, not necessarily like what people expected, but I think Solana is definitely like now in the running. And that's been obvious for the last year for a lot of folks that have been watching the space. So the investors that came in really wanted to invest in the ecosystem and the kind of growth that, that's happening all around us. There's certainly, you know, uh, some powerful growth, some big scale investors coming on board. But now that you've got this, uh, you know, this war chest, as it were, and, you know, it really does seem to be a, a battle for that alternative smart contract space, as you say, you know, what are your what are your aims for the money? What are your plans? How do you intend to sort of move forward with it? Yeah, th this is a, um, a tough challenge. When you look at something like a mature ecosystem like Google or iOS, there's 5,000 engineers at Google. That's a billion dollars a year in engineering costs, right? Even, even with what we raise, that's basically insurmountable to us, right? So I think these alternative um, platforms, alternative to the Web2 stacks, to the Google uh, apples of the world, are really these wide ecosystem plays in the true form of open source, we have something like Linux, right, which kind of started to penetrate every industry in the world, had engineers in basically every major corporation in the world start working on it. That's really what we need to see out of crypto networks. So our, our goal is really, you know, to unblock folks, to get them, get them started, get them going, um, and really have them develop the, the value that they seek out of, out of cryptocurrencies. It's so important to, to see that value, but you touched on a key point there, and one which I think you know, really fits with our conference theme, that idea of, of the game of chains, which is at the end of the day, particularly in the blockchain space, there's a limited number of developers. You know, and there's really you know, more coming on every day and people are, you know, it is a growing space, whatever, but as it stands right now, you know, that sort of labor productivity, you know, sheer developer hours that can be put out there into these projects is limited. And everyone's fighting for it. You know, obviously Ethereum has has that sort of you know network effect uh, that allows it to be you know ahead of the curve in many ways. You know, that got in so early. But you know, what do you see as being key to enticing uh, developers over to build on Solana and and to to make that the space for good smart contracting DApps and and beyond? Um, so for us, I think we really picked uh, you know these technologies are complicated and solving a really hard problem, which in general is you know, is one of the hardest problems in computer science. And the trade-offs in these solutions are what's typically called are Pareto efficient, right? It, you, you pick some aspect of the, of the tech that you really want to optimize and do your best in everything else. But that one, one particular thing that we picked is this idea of maximally censorship resistant network for information flow, like right now, right in this moment. Like, how do we, how do I guarantee that you know, market makers order gets in, into the chain. How do we guarantee that any transfers between any two funds are um, fairly scheduled? That kind of performance is really us targeting, you know, we're not we're not like trying to replace Ethereum. We have like, we had our sites set on NASDAQ on CME and, and Lana Stock Exchange um, at, at when we started building this. We, we weren't even considering like Ethereum as a competitor. 
for that particular use case because the design is just so different. Um, and when you have something that is different, you know, developers that see opportunity to leverage that and build their own applications, especially in finance, that's where they flock. So we've seen that um, over the year, a lot of folks, um, you know, saw Serum being built by a team out of FTX and now it has become its own ecosystem. A lot of developers that saw that there's now a new primitive for decentralized finance that isn't Uniswap, it's a true central limit order book. Um, just their light bulbs went off in their head to start building this next generation of financial products. So that that's really what we're seeing in, in our ecosystem. And that doesn't mean that there can't be other, you know, like you pick a design, you pick a specific product or an idea that is the key thing that you're building for, an ecosystem could form around that. Um, so we'll see how that, that kind of plays out. But I think there's certain aspects of the technology you know, like the difference between GPUs for graphics and CPUs for general applications that will just kind of naturally form into their own, you know, chunks of ecosystems in the in the wider cryptocurrency space. You know, it was, it was an interesting point you made before, which I'd kind of like to circle back to in, in conjunction with what you just said. So you said, you know, when you're comparing to, you know, the Apples and Googles of the world that, you know, no matter what you, you sort of raise or develop or whatever, you're never going to be able to scale against them for the time being because, you know, they're just, there's too much of a network, too many resources, whatnot. You know, we talk about this, you know, new technological development in the crypto space, new chains coming on board or chains coming on with different, you know, operability or, or technical capacity. But I wonder at what point do we hit uh, that sort of tipping point, that sort of where the, the, the Metcalf's law effect is so high on the existing, I don't know what number it is, but let's say 10 chains that exist out there that it's going to be impossible for new players to come into the market. You know, does that point exist? Are you worried about that? You know, as some as a as a project that's sort of only now building the space, although you've been around a while, but you know, to sort of and now sort of get you know, upscaling in the space, is that something that concerns yeah. you? I would say that like we will see that point when we get to you know three to five hundred million users with self custody with their own keys that know what they're know what they're doing to the level that people know how to use a web browser, you know, like. When we get to that level of adoption, that's really when I remember seeing an inflection point on the internet. You had three to 500 million people on the internet. You saw things like MySpace, Friendster, and later my, you know, Facebook pop up. And you know, two years prior to that, there was you know, 50 to 100 million people you know, using AOL keywords. And there's zero chance anybody could have told me that sharing pictures of your kids with your family is going to be worth half a trillion dollars, right? Like <laughs> it's going to be like the biggest network in the world, right? That, that That's just something that was totally unexpected, but was truly formed by the internet because of the interconnectivity that it solved, like at the just human connection and being able to, to share experiences together. That was not possible before. What I think is interesting about cryptocurrencies is that onboarding people to cryptography, it doesn't matter where they onboard, whether it's, you know, MetaMask on, on Ethereum or, you know, God forbid, Binance Smart Chain or whatever, right? Like, it doesn't matter where, right? They, they onboard to cryptography, then them switching to a different use case and a different chain is a much easier task. Um, so right now, you know, I don't really look at our competitors as like, zero sum, like we're growing the market really quickly. Like anyone that finds a new innovative way to get more people, install a wallet, figure out how to use a seed phrase, how to sign stuff, how to play with these systems is growing the pie for everyone else. So that's so interesting, you know, that sort of integrative approach, as you said, a rising tide lifts all ships idea. And you said that, I mean, it was a, a good quote I saw from you in a, in a recent Forbes article in relation to your, your big funding round said, you're so focused on trying to get the first billion users that it doesn't matter whether they sh first show up to Ethereum or not. That, that, that to you, you, you see it as a truly integrative process. I mean, that goodwill, I guess, you know, it's so anathema to so much of the tribalism that exists in the crypto space. Do you think you're, you know, I won't say alone, but, you know, relatively, uh, you know, okay. unique in that idea? Or is it, do, uh, is this do, a more pervasive do, idea? Do people were tribal about, uh file systems on Linux. 
<laughs> yeah it's, it's just in our nature and uh part of it is okay i think there's a lot of negative t- toxic parts to it but i think in the, in the best light of it like if you try to look at it from the best perspective it's just people being really passionate about uh the technology because it unlocks something for them in the future that wasn't possible before you know it, it's something like that they see that is bigger than just a current implementation um i think that idea that aspect is just really powerful when you combine it with you know ordinary humans with cryptography that are able to coordinate like seamlessly around the world i, I think when those two things meet um we're going to start seeing like what we saw in DeFi summer, but at a thousand X bigger. <laughs> so uh, like, the, like, you know, DeFi summer was what 30, 40,000 people all coordinating right. around a meme. Imagine 30, 40 million people. <laughs> it's, I mean, it is kind of hard to imagine, honestly, I, 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 you know, just, just what that, and what that looks like from a, I don't know, to say from a community perspective, you know, cause there's so much focus you know, right now on, you know, these new people coming on board into the space and, you know, new people coming into crypto for the first time. And it's something, as you've said, you're, you're focused on just getting people to, you know, have that first bite and, and sort of have that little taste and, and then, you know, open up to this new ideas till we get to the first billion. And as noble and great as that is, I so wonder about, you know, misinformation coming in. I wonder about, you know, uh, what if that first bite's sour? You know, what if that first bite is uh, a scam or a, or a dodgy deal or, a, you know, coming in and mistiming the market and they come in at the top and, and think that's it? I mean, does that not risk poisoning the well for good news? So my, my first experience with crypto was really uh, when this company promised to ship a ASIC for Bitcoin mining and they built it and then they used it to mine Bitcoin you know, for themselves for six months, and then they sent it to everyone else, <laughs> which, is, which I think was like really hilarious way to, to screw people over, uh, because you just wouldn't even expect it, right? It was just so clever, right, at that time, right? Like, right. <laughs> but like just delaying, delaying shipping the stuff for six months, they were able to like squeeze something out of their uh, out of their users. Um, I think right now, like the wild west of it is kind of like part of the charm, you know, like I think if you've been in crypto for a year, you've seen but if and you haven't been involved in something that just went totally south, uh, you haven't really experimented enough. Um, I think that's worthwhile for people to be aware of it and kind of understand that this is like a true peer to peer world. That means that anybody can interact with anybody. Everything is super connected and that you're responsible for those keys, right? You're the custodian of those keys. That's why it's, that's why this stuff is interesting. Um, and it's not, you know, nerfed like everything else. Um, and, you know, it'll probably change, you know, there's probably going to be like things like you, you already see that with more branded protocols. Like there's, it's, everything's open source. There's no modes. I can literally take Aave, Uniswap, and fork it and rebrand it and launch it. But because Aave and Uniswap come from these teams that have put tremendous amount of effort to make sure that these things are secure and work well for the users and the user experience is as good as possible, it's just I'm, you know, I'm fighting an uphill battle. I'm fighting a network, not not even the tech. Um, so we'll start seeing that kind of like, you know, we'll we'll start seeing those moats form around like good technologies and good teams. Um, but part of the charm of crypto is that it's easy for smart people to get together and launch something globally. And, and uh, in this current state that it's at, like the design space and the kind of product space, it's just so wide open for innovation that it, it's better to let people just kind of go innovate, see what they can accomplish. Absolutely. And there is such great innovation coming out, but I suppose, and, and you know, this is one theme that's come up again and again throughout this conference and talking to different people is that we, we sit at the moment at a, you know, a, I don't know if to call it a nexus of innovation, but you know, it sort of feels that way of, you know, this tipping point where, where so much, you know, great potential and, and different, you know, scales of growth can start to be achieved. And back to that idea of people coming into the market, people are looking 
for, I don't know if to say, you know, the benevolent leader or the charismatic uh, figures or, you know, that VIP culture, that influencer culture so much in a way that I don't think, you know, crypto was ever intended to be for. I mean, the whole idea of you know, Bitcoin and Satoshi's disappearance was that there wasn't this leader to rally around. And, you know, from there, it's, you know, the, the, the ethos of do your own research and, you know, all the notions, you know, not your keys, not your coins, all these sort of things that, you know, People who've been in the space a while might know, might believe, uh, might even be skeptical of, but still are aware of. And so many new people in the space are coming in, and from, you know, your Vitalik uh, Buterin's to your Charles Hoskinsons to your Elon Musk's, you know, whoever it might be, people are looking for these these leaders and these rallying points. Do you think that's detrimental to the industry, or just a natural part of its, you know, sort of fluctuations? Um. I think it's interesting. And in a lot of ways, I think that if Satoshi was known, he, it wouldn't have become this like massive persona, right? Because we don't know who that person is. It's easy to like uh, start building like a cult around it, right? Uh, I think like well, if you've ever met Vitalik, you're like, it's just a dude that's really into math and, and, and right. computer science. It's, it, it becomes a lot more uh, human. Um, and these things are interesting to observe. I don't, I don't know what lasting effects they will have. You have some of these personalities in, in tech, like Steve Jobs, obviously, um, and like Jeff Bezos, but we'll, we'll see how this stuff plays out. You know, at the end of the day, you still need to build products for users, get users to use them, you know, like give, get, get users like something interesting, something that they want. Um, and, and what what is it do you think users that users do want? I mean, what what is it that users are really pining for now that you think either does exist and needs to be developed or doesn't yet exist? I think we're still in these early stages where the founders that are coming into the space are building. Um, they're they're more visionary than like you know your standard Silicon Valley product iterate cycle. You know where you can have KPIs and look look at user metrics grow. Like still, like the the space is so early that it's more um, moonshotty big ideas that are going to win out, um, and that's really hard to predict. Like, what wh where is that magic combination, that secret, you know, recipe of like this amount of cryptography, this amount of like you know UX, and for these for this particular product, um, some of the more exciting stuff that I really like uh, are like things like Audius, um, which is a consumer application. But one that is really, um, really uses crypto, crypto in an interesting way. Like music is such a financial industry, right? Everything, every if as a musician, like if you like every, everything with music is finance, and the idea that you can have a decentralized platform that doesn't have any intermediaries, right? Like my music, my fans are connected directly like the, the data is all open, like all, all, all this stuff is totally transparent. Um, seems like a pretty revolutionary idea and one that I think might be disruptive because the people want it to be more so that it's a thousand times better than, um, you know, like Spotify or something like that. But there's a chance that like Audius could win um, because people want it to, right? There's like this inherent belief that we don't need any intermediaries between myself and the artists that I want to listen to. Like it, there's like a human connection between me and the people and the musicians that I like that, that I think is, can overcome a bunch of the UX problems we have today. Um, so stuff like that, I think it is like, you know, if you have these big ideas, this is where you should be. It's time right now to take those moonshots. Right? Absolutely. And, and it does seem the time is now, you know, before that heavy regulation enters the space when it is still that, uh, wild west as you sort of spoke about where people can can go out and innovate and take those moonshot ideas that you know 95 percent, 99 percent might fail but the one percent you know could change the world um and it does seem powerful but i i suppose i always wonder there was so much you know in the early days of crypto and oh, maybe it was still in the early days but in the earlier days of crypto i don't know people would talk about you know crypto as a as a revolution and blockchain as a revolution and now so much more the conversation is of an evolution and whether that evolution you know involves the legacy finance world whether it's about enterprises coming on board rather than you know toppling the old system and the new you know where do you think we stand with that idea you know you use the word revolution the word to audience but i mean that's 
that's about our music. There is money involved, obviously, but that's not about our day-to-day -day money. So is the idea there different? So I think the difference between now and three years ago was that people are shipping products right now versus just ideas. You know, a lot of people were like just, you know, their, their mind opened when they understood like the power of like peer to peer cryptography and all of these ideas seem possible. Social networks, everything like these like negative business models of stealing your data, selling you ads, those are all possible to replace with just peer to peer cryptography. But three years ago, none of the stuff could work, right? You don't have high performance blockchains. Today, like all this stuff is doable. Like you can literally go go build your like Reddit with without any ads with just social tokens, run it on Solana and you're and you're done. And then try to figure out how to do the hard work then. How do I build a community? How do I like uh, nurture it and grow it, right? To to a really strong user base with a bunch of people that want to, you know, engage and, and create content there. That that's the harder part. <laughs> that's that's real work. <laughs> um, the the tech is done, and that I think that's the main difference now is that you're seeing people slow down from imagination, right? The speed of imagination. I can ship white papers all day long. Right. To now, I have an idea and I have funding, and I need to go build products that actually get those users onboarded, and that's a slower process, but in reality, crypto is moving, you know, a thousand times faster than any of these big companies. Like how many teams are formed, how many teams are funded and products shipped, it's just astronomical. So then, I mean, you know, what, obviously, you know, when as these as chains battle it out, you know, at Solana, you know, you've thrown your hat in the ring and made a big splash and said, look, here we are, you know, we've got a, a proof of history approach. We've got, you know, the speed, the scalability, you know, all these elements that we want developers to come on board. We we have the capacity, the underlying tech is here, come and innovate, come and come and create in this space. But what sort of, I don't mean, I don't want to use the word advice because I think it sort of comes across as maybe a little pedantic. I don't know, like, but like what sort of, uh, sort of hope, attitude, whatever are you, are you trying to give to developers? What sort of base would you, would you like to give to developers to really help launch them off and, and let them run with these crazy ideas, whether they be good, bad or ugly? <laughs> I think the the hardest part for a lot of devs is to just kind of commit full time, go, you know, quit your big job at Google and, and like go try something. Uh, taking that step is pretty tough for a lot of folks. Um, you know, it was tough for me as well. But um, just kind of want to remind people that as an engineer, you're basically like, you know, if you go to a startup, and it fails, you'll be able to get your old boring job back at Google if that's what you want. <laughs> like those those doors are not going to close uh, for anyone because it just engineer talent. Talent is just keep, constantly keeps growing in demand and you really won't, won't know what it takes to go get funding, to build your first product, build an MVP until you quit and that pressure's on. And that, that kind of like, that pressure cooker is is a is a pretty important factor in this. So um, I don't know what what advice I can give to people except to you know just fully commit to it, jump in. <laughs> pressure makes diamonds, man. I mean, yeah, that exactly. Yeah, pressure makes diamonds, and you know it is so so critical to get people on you know out there making those risks. And I guess that's sort of what crypto's looking to do. But you know, at the same time. I guess you know. I always hear people say that the, the way we get you know blockchain uh, you know into the into the world and out to those next billion is to in essence make it boring and or invisible, right? Like that the actual blockchain technology should in and of itself be so sort of behind the scenes as to be uninteresting anymore and just you know a part of day to day life. Do you do you agree with that sentiment? And and is that sort uh, of a goal and an ethos you guys take up? Um, no, I think it's more like. The internet and browsers, right? Like you didn't re eliminate browsers. You didn't eliminate like you, we still have a URL with an HTTPS tag on it. That you know, what what percentage of the population understands what HTTP or HTTPS mean? Right. Pretty small, right? But it's all there. The tech is still there. The true part of the internet is there. People do understand what a browser is, and they understand what links are, and that level of understanding is what we need for cryptography and keys and signing. It doesn't have to be 
deep to the level of an engineer that understands like, you know, layer seven <laughs> uh, internet protocols, but it needs to be there. And I think it's achievable because people can kind of get it. They get what secrets are, they get, they can get what a wallet is and get this idea of a trusted environment that, that's signing things for them. Um, and once that becomes kind of general accepted knowledge, you will feel like the internet like has kind of melted away right a bit from our lives. You don't, you don't really think of it anymore as a, as a separate thing. It's just kind of become part of everyday use. We'll start seeing that with blockchain as well, but that'll take a while. I mean, it took, you know, close to 20 years, right. Of internet development. You really needed like a generation growing up that was uh, internet savvy. So, yeah, I mean, and in terms of that, that blockchain sort of nativity and, and savvy, as you speak about, you know, so much of the internet age, you know, was driven by these, these big, uh, you know, tech hubs, you know, obviously Silicon Valley, you know, being the, the, the most obvious one that people think of when it comes to you know, sort of crypto development in the space. I mean, you spoke about, you know, the sort of typical, you know, idea of a, you know, a, a Google engineer, you know, leaving their job and going out and trying something. Um, but, you know, so much about the narrative around blockchain and crypto is this idea of democratization and distribution, and it's, it can be across the entire world, you know, and they can be sitting in, in Lahore or in, you know, uh, Berlin or, or, or wherever, uh, you know, uh, Kinshasa, who, who cares where these people are, it doesn't matter, and they can communicate with teams across the web and, and use the underlying technologies to do that, they don't need to be in that sort of geographic hub as was once the, the, the sort of in the pre-internet days or in the... Sort of yeah. Web 2.0 days. I mean, do you believe that that's the future, or is it still happening in the in the sort of Google centers of the world? Um, I think Silicon Valley still has this, a bit of a gravity, but it's definitely like the teams that we see forming are nearly always outside of Silicon Valley, and nearly always more more plugged in and like more crypto native than anybody coming in right now from Google. Like, <laughs> like I almost feel like the folks quitting Google into crypto is gonna be the last stage of <laughs> this last stage of crypto, um, which is I think an interesting phenomenon. Um, but what's I think also kind of part of this is that there isn't any single central space that these folks are at except the internet. So it's really more like not Silicon Valley being replaced by Miami or Austin or, you know, Berlin or something. It's really being replaced by the internet itself. You know, those communities where we meet and hang out like crypto Twitter or whatever, like that, that's the new Silicon Valley, so to speak. Um, it's, it, it's, it is and it isn't though, right? Because then you have something like, you know, people do hang out on crypto Twitter and, and they do do all that, but then you got something like, you know, uh, Bitcoin Miami, in which people actually get back in a room together, and for better or worse, you know, they start to form those connections again. And still, I think there was something about that conference, you know, as sort of the, the the symbol and the emblem of, you know, we're back together, the world can can be back as one and actually meet in person. That kind of drove home to me at least that nothing beats being in a room with someone and, and at the end of the day that that geography still matters as much as you may have spoken infinitely online what are your thoughts uh, i think the genie is out of the bottle to be honest um, um uh, so at least for anybody that that's seen growth and, and development over the last year like some of you know i i didn't meet sam bankman freed from ftx until bitcoin miami like we <laughs> right and, and like folks like that that you're able to connect with online and like form a uh you know deep relationship with both like you know like that can now happen i think i think prior to this like last year of forced internet <laughs> forced internet communication like you still relied on these like warm handshakes as a way to establish trust that initial kind of point okay you're a person i can trust you um but I think now we can do this over Zoom, um, which is really weird, but also kind of, <laughs> you know, I, I think this will really kind of accelerate like culture development, like across the entire world. Suddenly uh, it is a tipping point uh, for better or worse. And maybe you are right. That genie is 
to some degree out of the bottle, uh, you know, and people will uh, no longer care for the, the, the warm handshake, uh, warm handshake. All right. Well, but I, uh, I, I, I don't, I, I think it's, I don't think it's necessary. Right. I, I think people will find it easy to, to kind of like, just take that first step, right. Just from an online conversation be like, okay, I kind of, I know this person just from talking to them. And then you still have the freedom to like meet up and everything else, but there isn't this strong requirement that everybody is in Silicon Valley in San Francisco, that we all like, you know, graduated Stanford and got funding on Sand Hill Road. Like that, that bit I think has kind of been um, flipped, you know, <laughs> we're, we're, we're in a different world where this stuff can happen on the internet and, and move just as fast and if not faster. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No need for a 12 hour plane flight from you know, some part of Europe to some part of wherever else. Um, exactly right. And, and all right. So, you know, I, I want to start sort of, uh, you know, wrapping towards the end of this conversation. But, uh, you know, I guess, you know, we've spoken about your, your big funding, you, you, you've hit this next milestone. But as with ending in the crypto space, you can't simply sit on your laurels and, and lord your success. Where to from here? Where to next? What is the next big goal that Solana is uh, thinking and focusing on? Um, I mean, yeah, we never get a chance to take a break. <laughs> our, uh, I don't know if you've been watching our hackathon. We, we had over 12,000 people sign up. And right now are, are sifting through, like, I think over 400 submissions for teams. Um, and looking for those, like, next, next generation, like, startups, founders that want to build these, like, you know, decentralized products for a billion people. So that's definitely like kind of what we plan on doing is really accelerating that part of the ecosystem growth, getting as many more teams in as many more teams building like really cool products. Um, I don't know, folks should check out Metaplex, which is an NFT platform that can do everything that you ever wanted with NFTs for like, you know, pennies. <laughs> uh, like what the, one of the first drops was uh, multiple gigabyte videos, which is, which is pretty interesting. Um, that that like kind of level of um, like let's just try a bunch of stuff and let let's see what sticks. Like seeing those um, developers um, with their ideas like coming into the space is what's really exciting to me. Um, because like I said in the start of our conversation, there's no way we can build a five thousand person team and try to compete with Google. It's going to be this ecosystem, right? It's going to be a bunch of folks that have their own ideas, their own vision that are all driving towards it. Certainly right. And getting all that vision together in one space is a, is a hell of an achievement uh, in and of itself. But uh, so much more still to come and, and so much more development to come. So Anatoly, I want to I thank you for, for taking that time to speak with us uh, you know, here at Reimagine. Uh, and everyone else uh, watching, I want to make sure you, know, you stick with us. So much more good content in and around this conference. Um, but Anatoly, last word, anything you want to you wanna shout out to the, to the world, world at large? Um, shit, shoot, didn't have anything prepared. All right. Um, I want to uh, just like think of thank all the devs and validators that are like really the heartbeat of the network that keep making this thing work day after day. So yeah, keep at it. Yeah, important message uh, coming off the mat off the spot. And uh, I think, uh, you know, a, a key one for, for everyone to pay attention to. All right. Anatoly, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. All right. Take care.